Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar organized by the Office of the CTO at GitHub. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce John Hughes, Professor of Computer Science at the University of Chalmers. Like many computer science students in the late 80s, I was personally deeply influenced by John's paper, Why Functional Programming Methods. Instead of merely preaching the merits of technical features of functional languages, the paper clearly demonstrated their practical benefits, and it convinced many of us to pursue a career in programming languages. Indeed, uh, without John's inspiration, I wouldn't be at GitHub today, so very much uh, thanks for that, John. John continues to push the boundaries of programming language technology, in particular as the CEO of Cubic, which offers products and services around property-based testing. It is a powerful technique that deserves to be much better known than it is today. Uh, he's going to tell us more about it. Uh, before he does that, a few housekeeping remarks. If you have questions for John, uh, please use the Q&A feature of the GoToWebinar uh, app to post these. Uh, we'll collect them throughout the session, and at the end, John will answer as many of these live as possible. John, please take it away. Okay, thank you for the introduction again. So, I hope you can all see my slide. I am uh, actually physically in the west of Sweden. This is what it looks like. Um, and I, I'm going to tell you about some adventures with property-based testing. So, for a start, what is it? Uh, I want to kick off with a small example. Here's the code. You don't have to read it. It's a little bit of C code. And what it does is it implements a queue uh, as a circular buffer. So I want to show you the API, uh, just to show you what it does. And uh, I'd like to do that interactively in a REPL. C doesn't have a REPL, but Erlang does, that can call C. So let me just um, do a simulated demo on the slide and, and show you what the API does. So this is the Erlang uh, REPL. Uh, the 24, the black stuff is the prompt, ignore it. The orange stuff is what I typed. And here I've called the new function to create a queue with space for four elements. And the green stuff is the response. I get back the address. OK, so what can I do with a queue once I've got one? Well, I can put data into it. This queue holds integers. So let's put one, let's put two. Um, then I can ask, how many items are in the queue? Well, obviously two, right? So I call the size function, and that returns two. And I can take things out of the queue again. Um, I call get, I get the one. I get the two, I get uninitialized memory, I get some more uninitialized memory, I get the one and the two again. Remember, it's a circular buffer. Um, so it behaves exactly as you would expect C code with no error checking to behave. That's fine. You can see that it works. So that's a little live demo, as it were, of what the code does. But of course, I would also like to have tests for this code. And uh, one thing I can do is just take these calls and turn them into an automated test. And just put them into an Erlang function. Now, maybe I don't want to include the calls that uh, read uninitialized memory. I was really abusing the API there. But if I take the others, I can put them into a little function that just makes those calls and then matches the result against the expected value. If any function returns a different result, then the test will fail. The one interesting thing I want to point out about this very simple test case is it covers 100% of the code. That's great. I've got 100% branch coverage, which is quite easy because there aren't any branches here. But um, nevertheless, it covers 100% of the code. So that's great, right? So I've got simple program, seems to work, and I've got excellent testing for it. So I'm done. Or am I? The way I like to test code is not like this, of course. It's using property-based tests. So let me show you what happens when I do that. Um, I call our property-based testing tool, Quick Check, to do so, and I have to give it a property of the code. I'm not going to show you this uh, test code. I'll explain a little bit what it looks like, but let's just see what happens when we run these tests. Quick Check starts generating random test cases, and whoops, 
one of them failed. So it looks as like though the code isn't quite as good as, um, as I gave the impression earlier. When the test fails, uh, it's a randomly generated test case. It's large. It goes on and on and on. And I think the one thing you can conclude about that is you don't want to use that as a starting point for debugging. But no problem, because the next thing which it does is shrink the test case, so-called. That is, try and simplify it. Exactly what you would do manually uh, every time you get a, a failed test that is more complicated than it needs to be. And the result of shrinking is that we end up with a much smaller, uh, uh, in a sense, a minimal test case that has failed. And this is the output that I, that I got. And the bit I wanted to look at on the slide is highlighted in yellow now. So this just shows the sequence of steps that the test case performed, and we can see what went wrong. So let's look at it. What happened? First of all, I created a queue with space for one element. OK, then I put something into it. OK, that's fine. Now the queue is full. Uh, there's one thing in it. And then I asked, how many items are in the queue? I got zero. OK, that's clearly wrong. And so a post condition in my property will fail. That's why the test failed. So um, now we have a little example. We can just work through this example, look at the code, and see if we can debug it. OK, what happened first? First, I created a queue of size one. And um, what I did with that parameter to new was I saved it in the size field of the data structure. Again, you don't need to read the code, but just remember the size field is one. And then at the end of the test, I called the size function to see how many items are in the queue. And here's the code for that. Look, I'm taking the difference between an input position and an output position, sounds, sounds reasonable, modulo the size. But the size is one. Every number modulo one is zero. That's why this doesn't work. This size function can only return zero when the size is one. So, so of course it doesn't work. Actually, the situation is worse than that because if I look at the code for putting something in the other part of the test, we can see that it writes some data into a buffer and that it increments this input position, modulo the size, modulo one. And that means that that is also going to remain at zero. I have a little animation uh, to show us what happened. I've got a buffer and I've got this input and output pointer into it. I put something in, incremented the input pointer, modulo one. And now the buffer is full, but those input and output pointers are exactly where they were at the beginning. So here's the problem. The code doesn't work because a full buffer looks exactly like an empty one. And if you think about it, this isn't just a problem when the size is one. If I had a buffer of any size and filled it completely, the input pointer would wrap back to the beginning. And so the full buffer looks like an empty buffer. So I'm going to fix the code now, and I have to fix this problem. And uh, I'm going to do it using a, a very nice hack. It's very clever. The problem only appears when the buffer becomes entirely full, right? So what I'm going to do, when I'm asked to create a buffer of size n, then under the hood, I'm going to create a buffer of size n plus 1. And now, when I do that, the bug can only appear if somebody tries to put n plus 1 things into a buffer of size n. And if they do that, that's their fault, not mine. And so I claim my code works. So if I make this change, then I can rerun the last test like this. Uh, EQC check saves the last test and so that it can be repeated. And of course, now it passes. OK, so the code wasn't as perfect as I thought. I found one bug. Let's run some more random tests and see what happens. OK, so if I do that, wow, another test fails. And once again, the randomly generated one is huge. We don't want to see it. But after shrinking, we end up with something which is, again, quite simple. Once again, I want us to look at the yellow bit here that shows us what happened in the test. So what did I do? Well, I made a queue of size one again. Under the hood, that's really two. 
I put something in, it's now it's full. I took it out, put something in again, now it's full. It contains one item, obviously. And I asked for the size. I got minus one. What? What is going on? Let me show you an animation of this example. I put something in, I took it out, and that increments the output pointer. I put something in again, and now I've put two items into a circular buffer of size two, so the input pointer wraps around. And then I called the size function. What did that do? It took the difference between the input and output position modulo the size. It's just fill in the numbers. That's zero minus one modulo two, or minus one modulo two. What is that? Minus one modulo two is plus one. I know that. I have a mathematics degree. But in C, minus one percent two is minus one. Because the percent sign in C is not mathematical modulus, it's remainder. And that's different when the first argument is negative. So that's why I get a negative result from size, which is clearly bonkers. What I have to do is I have to make sure that that expression in the size function is never negative. Because I'll get the wrong answer if it is. And of course, there's an easy way to do that. Here, let me patch it. I'll just call the absolute value function. Right? And then instead of taking minus one remainder two, I'm taking plus one remainder two, and the value will be plus one. And uh, if I make that fix in the size function, like that, and repeat the last test, it passes. That's great. So now I want to think about what we've done. I had found a bug in my code, a slightly subtle one. I created a test case to provoke that bug. I patched my code, I repeated the test, now it passes. All my tests are green. I'm done, right? People might often think so. But of course, I don't trust a single test, I like to generate them. So let's run some more random tests. What happens? What? Another failure. And if we look at the shrunk test in this case, it's a little bigger. And it starts off by creating a queue with space for two elements instead of one. Why is that? It's because queues of size one work now. Progress. But this case of size two doesn't. So we create a queue of size two under the hood. That's really three. What does the test case do? It puts three things in. That's going to make that in pointer wrap around. It takes one thing out. How many things are in the queue? Two. What did the size function return? One. That's the problem. And if I animate this for you, you see I put one thing in, I took it out, I put another thing in, I put a third thing in, the pointer wrapped around, and then I called the size function, which takes this difference modulo size. So that's what I started off doing. And if I fill in the numbers, that's computing minus one modulo three. Minus one modulo three mathematically is two. That's the right answer. But if I put in the absolute value function, which worked for the previous example, then of course it's got to turn the minus one into a plus one. And so we get the wrong result. And that's what's gone wrong. My fix was buggy. So my fix. I had thought correctly that I have to make sure that first argument of percent is uh, never negative, but abs is the wrong way to achieve that. And luckily, there's a different way. What I can do instead is just add on the size. And uh, that's going to be enough, it's three in this case, to make sure that that first argument is never negative. But adding size doesn't change the value modulo size. And so I'll end up with the correct result. And if I repeat that, Last test, of course it passes, and indeed any number of tests will now pass, and I, I ran 10,000, so that gives me some confidence. So there we are, there's, there's a little example of testing some, some code. And what have we seen? A number of things. 
we've seen that even though I started off with a test for the code that had 100% coverage, there were still bugs there, and I could find them with property-based testing. We've seen that I could find several different bugs with the same test, and that's something that happens all the time with property-based testing. Um, we've also seen that when a bug is found, it's reported as a minimal test case that provokes the bug, thanks to shrinking, and that makes those bugs easy to understand. But we also saw that when I made a wrong bug fix and I overfitted my fix to the failing test that I happened to have, I didn't get away with it. I immediately found a slightly different example that showed that the underlying bug was still there. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've seen so much weird code in production systems that was obviously put there by somebody trying to make a test case pass. And they put something that made their case pass but didn't fix the underlying bug. And uh, with property-based testing, you can't get away with that, thank goodness. So what's the overall picture? We're generating random test cases. We need to have a property that can inspect the result of each test and tell us whether or not this test failed. When a test does fail, the test case that we get, the random one, is usually very big and ugly and not a good starting point for debugging. But that's no problem because the next thing we can do is take that nasty test case and start shrinking it. And when it shrinks down to a minimal example, a small example that provokes the bug, then it becomes easy to squash. So this picture shows the basic idea uh, behind property-based testing. Okay. Um, so the kind of property that I've been using here is a state machine model. I just want to briefly sketch how those work um, because we use them a whole lot for many different kinds of software. We generate test cases that are a sequence of calls to an API. So these squares represent those steps. How do we know what each call should return? Well, we make a model as simple as we can of the state of the system. For the queue, it was just a list of the values that should be in the queue. And then we write a model state transition function for each kind of operation in the test. And that lets QuickCheck figure out what the model state will be at each point in the test. We run the test on the real system, and we write post conditions that compare the real outputs to the model. So that's what the state machine model looks like. That's its structure. And we've found so many bugs with this kind of test. I want to show you some of my favorite bugs. The first one is a bug that we found in an Ericsson firewall product. And um, the, the purpose of this product was to connect multimedia calls across the firewall. And the way that you connect a call is you add a caller to it. And there's a, a step in the protocol that says, do just that. So you add the first caller, you add the second caller. And once you've done that, then you can enable communication and the call is underway. When you finish the call, you subtract the callers again. So here I've subtracted one. And the happy case, the case that had been tested, was of course that you then subtract the other caller. But you don't have to do that. Um, what you can do instead is add a third caller. So you switch the call from one person to another. Do you remember old phones used to be able to do that? You could switch between several different callers. Well, this protocol would let you do that. Okay, so I might talk to um, another person, and then we can subtract the caller. But even here, you don't have to stop now and subtract the other one. You can keep going. You can add a fourth caller. And it, this is what our test case did. And it turns out that when you subtract the third, the thing crashes. Okay, so I really love this bug. Why? Well, one reason is that this was the bug that persuaded Ericsson to invest in property-based testing. But um, I love it also because this is a test case that nobody in their right minds would write in a test suite. Look at it, what's it doing? It's adding and subtracting a caller. We try it once, it worked. We try it twice, it worked. By induction, it must work any number of times. Only it doesn't, it fails the third time. Why would you test that? And bear in mind that the protocol has a dozen different commands you could be using in your tests. 
why would you write a test that does this? And yet, this is the smallest test that provokes the bug. You might think that it's also something that is unlikely to happen in practice. Well, uh, maybe so. But this is the test case that revealed the bug. What was the bug? The bug was that every time you subtracted a corner, the subtraction operation corrupted data. Just so happened that if the next thing you did was subtract the other corner, then you threw away the corrupt data before it could cause a problem. But of course, it's bad to have corrupt data in your system. And this test case turned data corruption into a crash, making it detectable. So this looks like a simple example. Um, I just want to add that the RFC we had to read to write the tests was 212 pages, plus another 183 about how Ericsson planned to use it. So this was actually quite a substantial testing effort, um, but we found this lovely bug as a result. I want to show you a couple more. Uh, here is a bug that we found for Volvo cars. Um, Volvo cars hired us to uh, test software from the suppliers that is the basic software running in cars. And uh, some of the software in the car manages what's called the CAN bus. That's the network that's most widely used in vehicles. So we were testing a protocol stack for the CAN bus. And here's a bug that we found. So when you send a message on the CAN bus, it has a message identifier that identifies the type of message, but is also its priority. So the test case starts off by sending a message of priority one. What happens? Well, we see it being sent. That's good. Now the bus is busy and our test case sends two more messages with priorities two and three. They have to be queued up uh, in the protocol stack. And the final step of the test case is one that's a call that's usually made by the driver software for the bus hardware. And it confirms that message number one has been sent. So now the bus is free, the stack can send another message, one of the queued ones. It should choose the highest priority message. And um, highest priority means lowest number. So it should send message number two. It sent the wrong one. Now, why did that happen? It turns out that it's because of a weirdness in the Canvas protocol. So these priorities, they're also the message identifier. They identify the type of message. And the first version of the protocol allowed 11 bits for this value. But that means you could only have 2,000 different message types in the entire car. It's just not enough in a modern vehicle. Modern vehicles contain about 100 million lines of code. It's like saying a 100 million line Java program may only use 2,000 classes. Of course, it's too few. So newer versions of the protocol also allow an extended identifier of 29 bits. And the protocol stack has to support both. And it has to know whether its current message has an extended ID or a standard one so it can encode the packet correctly. So this particular stack stored the CAN ID in an unsigned 32-bit integer. And because there are three spare bits at the top of the word, it used the top bit to encode whether this ID was extended or not. Well, now you can perhaps imagine what really happened. That priority two message had an extended CAN ID. And the code should have masked off that top bit before comparing the priorities, but somebody forgot to do that. As a result, the message with priority two was treated as a message with priority two to the 31 plus two. And so of course it was not sent next. So I love this bug as well. Uh, I love it partly because it really matters. Those priorities are there for a reason. Everything in the car talks on the CAN bus. You know, the stereo, the brakes, you want the critical messages to have priority. So it really matters. But secondly, it's unlikely that you would find this bug by a handwritten test case. You might write a test case that looked like this, but the bug depends on a feature intera interaction between priorities for the bus and whether you have an extended or a standard CAN ID. You probably wouldn't write this very test case, which is needed to provoke the bug. So it's another kind of bug that you can really only find by generating tests. So this was a great uh, project. We read 3,000 pages of PDFs 
we turned that into 20,000 lines of quick check code, six pages, six lines per page, that's not so bad. We tested more than a million lines of C code from six different suppliers, and we found more than 200 problems in this critical code. So, uh, so that was great. Let me tell you about my favorite bug of all time. This was a bug in a database used at Klarna. Uh, Klarna were a hugely successful Swedish startup in the 2000s, they're a big company now, uh, supporting payments for web shops. But in the 2000s, their database didn't work. And here's a quote about it. There's a lurking bug, we've got bad objects and premature end of file every other month the last year. So this was a big problem for them. It crashed their main server once every couple of months. And then they could keep serving customers with backup servers, but they would have to rebuild the database on the main server every time it happened. It took hours. So by the time I looked at this problem, then the crashes had actually increased. They were happening every week. And the guys working with the database implementation had spent more than six weeks at Klarna trying to figure out what was going on. And the best hypothesis at the end of that was, it seems to happen when the file is about one gigabyte. Maybe it's something to do with rehashing. So it was obviously some kind of race condition. And I thought, let's try generating parallel tests for this problem. So parallel tests are a little trickier than the sequential tests I already talked about. Um, we generate tests that look like this. First of all, you do some random stuff to get into a random state, then you fork off parallel processes and they each do some more random stuff. The question is, how do you know whether or not the results that you get are correct? How do you know if your test has passed? It turns out there's a very simple way of doing that. And that is to take the results that you get from those parallel calls and just see, is there some order in which we could have performed those calls that would make the results consistent with the sequential model? If so, the behavior was linearizable, and we'll say that the test passed. If not, it failed. So using this idea, I can take a sequential model, and I made one for this part of the database. It was only 100 lines of code, so quite simple. And by changing two lines, I could use it for race condition testing instead. And here is my favorite bug of all time. Look at it. This provokes the premature end of file error. First of all, sequentially, we open the file, we close it, we open it again, and then we do three things in parallel, one lookup and two insertions. Do all of that, and occasionally, you get a premature end of file error, the file is corrupted. So when I saw this test case, I thought, there's something wrong with shrinking. This cannot possibly be the smallest test that provokes this bug. But it is. Look at that. Open, close, open. I thought, no, no, it must be enough just to open it once. So I manually simplified the test case. I ran that simplified test tens of thousands of times, passed every single time. And indeed, today I know why. Because when we start the test case, the file doesn't exist. We open the file, that creates it. We close it. The second open opens an existing file. It's very slightly different. You get into a very slightly different state, and that difference is critical for making the race condition possible. So once again, ask yourselves this. Would you write this test in a test suite? Of course not. Why pick that? And yet, this is the smallest test that can possibly reveal this bug. And it took about 10 minutes of property-based testing to find. So. Hard work, but um, but worth it. And I also found the bad object bug. I'm not going to talk you through it. You can see it's about the same size, not complicated. So before I did this, more than six weeks of effort was spent. Uh, people thought you needed a gigabyte of data to make it happen. Now we know I spent less than one day in total writing this model and running the tests. Um, you need a database with at most one record to provoke the bugs. In each case, you can reproduce them with only five or six calls. And given those bugs that I showed you, the developer of the code was able to fix the problem in less than a day in each case. 
So this really shows the enormous power of shrinking and the of shrunk test cases for debugging compared to trying to debug faults like this in production, when not only the five or six, six relevant things, but millions of irrelevant things have also happened. Okay, so that, that's a, a race condition bug that we found this way. I can't resist also showing you some bugs we found in Dropbox. So testing Dropbox is tricky because there is the Dropbox daemon in the background that can be taking actions. So in our model, we don't know what state we're in. We know what state we tried to get to perhaps, but then we have to model all of the possible background actions that Dropbox might take. And then we'll carry out a step in the test, like maybe write a file, and we don't know what state we're in, we don't know what state we reach, but after we've taken an action, Dropbox might take a bunch of other background actions, and so on. So there's a whole tree of possible states that we might get into. We have to model them all. Luckily, we can keep it down to a manageable number if every time we take an action, we also observe something about the files in the Dropbox. And those observations will rule out many of the possible states. So we do that as we run the tests. And if we can find a path that it, where all the observations are consistent with the model, then um, we'll say the test passed. And if we can't, then we'll say the test failed. And uh, in practice, we found that we had to track maybe up to a thousand possible states during the test, but not more than that. And that was enough to find some really interesting behavior. Here's what I like. These two arrows represent two different nodes, each of which is running Dropbox uh, and they're, they're synchronizing. So first of all, on one of the nodes, we'll write to a file. We're only using one file here. We'll write A to it. That's fine. Then on the other node, we'll write B to it. And we'll observe that we overwrote a file containing A. So when we see that, that tells us that Dropbox must have synchronized the file from one node to the other between those two calls. So we know a bit what's going on. What next? Let's delete the file on the first node. And when we delete it, we see that it, we're deleting a file containing A. So that means that Dropbox have not synchronized the B back to the original node yet. And now we'll write C to the file. And once again, we'll see that the file didn't exist. So the B hasn't been synchronized back. So now we've got a conflict, right? We've, got a, we've written B on one node, C on the other. When we read the file, what will we see? Well, we might see B, we might see C. Here's what happened. Doesn't exist. What? Surely we should see either B or C. Well, that's, that's a bit uh, worrying. Now, actually this is timing dependent. If you wait long enough, the file does reappear. So the, I think it's weird that it doesn't exist. That's one problem. But if we then wait for everything to stabilize, it should reappear. And it might contain B, it might contain C. We don't know which. In this case, when we ran the test, it contained C. But those of you who are Dropbox users will know that the B should not disappear. The B should appear in a conflict version of the file. Right, so, you, so that you don't lose data. If the timing is right in this test, no conflict file ever appears. And so this is, again, I think weird, weird behavior and the Dropbox developers agreed this was a bug. Uh, it should have been fixed by now, luckily. And it was always rare. Um, but we found these rather cool behaviors in a distributed system like Dropbox as well. So I've shown you um, lots of examples of nice bugs that we could found, find by property-based testing. And it works insanely well. So you might wonder why. And I'm going to try and give you some intuition for why it works so well. We generate test cases that do quite a lot of steps. And usually when a test fails, it's not because of every step. It's because of just a subsequence of steps. You know, maybe in this case, there are five steps that cause the failure, and that's the bug we're looking for. It's those five steps that we want to shrink to that will show us what the problem was. But you'll notice there are lots of other steps here as well. Often, those other actions don't matter much. 
So it's not always true, of course, but often, if those five red steps appear anywhere in your test case, the test will fail. So what does that mean? That means when we run one longer test, in a sense, we're testing every subsequence. And how many of those are there? We're getting exponentially much value out of a linear amount of testing work. And I think this, strictly speaking, this isn't true, but it is truthy, to borrow a word from Stephen Colbert. So um, this is intuition for why this approach of generating tests and shrinking them works so extremely well. Of course, it doesn't always work nicely. Let me just uh, mention a couple of things that can go wrong. One of the things that can go wrong is if you use this approach of defining a model of your system, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, the model can end up getting more and more complicated and start looking rather like the system itself. This is one trap you can fall into when you use a model as a reference for testing a real system. You end up replicating some of the code from the system in the model. That's not good. For a start, it's expensive. It feels as though you're doing the same work twice. Expensive is not good. But even worse, if you do this, and you've made a mistake in the system because of some misunderstanding, the chances are you make the same mistake in the model. So it's not only expensive, it's low value. And obviously, if a technique is both expensive and low value, people aren't going to use it. So models often work well, but sometimes they don't. And you need an alternative approach in those cases. And luckily, there is one. It's something that I called metamorphic properties. I'm going to illustrate the idea uh, talking about testing insertion into a collection. And I'm calling my collection T because in my case, it was a tree. OK, so we're going to test inserting a key value pair into the collection T and we get some new collection. So how do we test this? How do we predict what the resulting collection should be? Well, of course, we could re-implement insert in the test code, but there's no point in doing that, right? We'd be falling into the trap that we don't want to fall into. But here's a different way of thinking about how to test this operation. You could ask yourself, how would changing the input of insert change its result? Changing the input, what do I mean? Well, for example, suppose we insert something else before we do the insertion we want to test. Now, you might say, instead of having one unknown collection on my slide, I've got three. Is that better? Yes, it is better, because the two unknown collections at the bottom of the slide should be related. How? The one on the right should be just like the one on the left, except that it also contains the key K prime. So if I take the one on the left and I insert K prime and V prime into it, I should get the same result as doing the insertion in the other order. So here, I still don't know what any of those three collections should be. I can't predict that. But I can predict that both ways around this square should lead to the same result. And that lets me write a property for testing. Here's how it looks in Haskell. Um, so here, the property is parameterized on the two key value pairs and the collection. And all of those will be randomly generated. And the property just says that whether you, you know, whatever order you do the insertion in, you get the same collection as a result. Very simple, nice test. Of course, you may be wondering, is this really true? You may be thinking about it. Don't think. I like to let QuickCheck do my thinking for me. So if I want to know if this is really true, I'll just test it. And when we do, bang, it's not. Look at the example. Uh, the interesting part is in red. So these are the two key value pairs that make this property false. And oh, yes, if I insert the same key twice for this kind of collection, there's only one value per key. So the last insertion wins, obviously. But what the property says is that the order of insertion doesn't matter. That can't be right. So when you construct metamorphic properties like this, 
very often they're not always true. There's some case like this, some special case that makes them false. That doesn't mean we have to throw it away. It means we have to adapt the property a little bit. So I can just add a clause that says, if the keys are equal, then what I just said, the last insertion wins. Otherwise, you can swap the assertions over. And by doing that, I get a property that passes all its tests. That's great, and it's a, it's a useful test of insert. The cool thing about this is I didn't need to write a model. And if we take this idea, and we've got an API with n ways of changing a collection, we get a quadratic number of ideas for properties we can write. So we can write a lot of testing properties without ever needing to construct a model. And that makes metamorphic properties quite an effective way of uh, testing this kind of code. There's one more thing that can go wrong, and to do that, I'm going to show you a really, really tiny example. Uh, this is not real code, but it's inspired by code from a cryptocurrency company, um, not Bitcoin, obviously, who implemented their blockchain in Haskell. So when you implement uh, cryptocurrency, then you need to represent coin amounts. Let's have a type for that. This defines a new type in Haskell. A coin basically just contains an int. But it's not the same as an int because there is an upper limit on the total number of coins that may ever exist. And I'm going to just assume that it's one million for the purposes of this example. In reality, it's much more than that, like billions. Um, but now there should never be a coin value larger than one million. So let, let's just write a validity checking function. A coin is valid if the integer in it is in the correct range of values. And then we need to define operations on coin values, like, for example, addition. We're going to need to be able to combine coin quantities. And all of these functions have to uh, check for overflow. And if overflow occurs, then um, in Haskell, typically, we would return nothing instead of the value. So nothing, it's the Haskell equivalent of the null pointer. So no results in that case. OK, so this code is all very simple, but it still needs to be tested, right? So what property could I write for testing this? Well, I could write an addition property that takes two randomly generated coins as arguments, adds them together, and then checks we get the right result. What is the right result? Well, I don't want to replicate the code and add, but let's suppose I just make a coin that contains the sum of their values. That might be valid or not. If that is valid, then that's what I should get. And if it's not valid, then I should get nothing back as the result. OK, so I can write this property, run lots of tests, 10,000 in this case, and, and it passes. That's great. So that's a very simple piece of property-based testing. But here's what you should be asking yourself. What did I test exactly? So here, we've got two kinds of cases. We've got the normal case and the overflow case. Did I test them both? Maybe all my random coins were small and I never overflowed. I just don't know. And this is a problem with property-based testing, that because you don't see the test cases, there's a risk that you're doing a lot of trivial tests, and but you don't realize it. So we always have to mitigate that risk by making measurements of the actual tests. What we do is we label the test cases. And there's a function in the QuickCheck API for doing that. Uh, so I'll just attach a label to every test uh, that is a string. And I've written a little function summarized for computing that. So if the total is in the right range, I return normal. If it's outside it, I return overflow. And now when I run the tests, I will get some statistics. And we can see that, oh, yeah, it's good. I've got about 50% of each. So that's good. Both kinds of tests are appearing often. OK, now just think about this a little bit. One of the important lessons here is that just because you're doing property-based testing doesn't mean you don't need your brain. So ask yourself, what cases would you want to test here? If you were to write unit tests for the add function, what tests would you write? And I would say the add function is imposing a boundary between normal and overflow. Is that boundary in exactly the right place? To find out, I need to run tests that fall close to the boundary. At the moment, I don't know how many tests did that. 
but I can find out. I can just enrich my labeling function. And I've chosen arbitrarily to say, uh, if the total is within three of the maximum, then this is a boundary case. So how many of those am I running? Let's see. Run my measurements. Oh, not a single boundary case. So in fact, I ran 10,000 tests, which sounds good, but I'm actually not testing the most interesting cases at all. And why is that? Because the generator, which I also had to write for coins, looks like this. All you, you have to pay attention to here is that I'm calling the choose function to choose a uniform random number between zero and the maximum value. Well, obviously, if I take two of those and add them together, it's very unlikely that the result will fall close to the boundary that I care about. Now, at this point, you might be tempted to say, well, why don't I just write those unit tests instead? Don't do that. Much better is to change the generator so that it makes those tests more likely. For example, like this. Let me start by picking a non-negative n, and that, that will be a small number. I know that because of the way uh, the library works. And then I'll choose between three things. Either just return the small number, or return the maximum value minus the small number, or choose uniformly in the entire range. So this generator can still generate any coin value that's valid, but it will more often generate values near the endpoints. And if I change this generator instead and retest my property, oh, it fails actually. It fails for the case of zero of one million, because when you add them together, add returns nothing and the property expects it to return just one million. If I show you the code again, I've highlighted the bits that cause the bug, and it's obvious what the problem is. Uh, in the, the validity test, I said a valid coin must have a value less than or equal to the max, and in the addition function, I just tested is it less than the max. So I've gotten off by one error, and uh, it's impossible to say which one is right. I can make either choice, but I must make it consistently. And if I change the code so that it is consistent, then the tests pass. And again, we'll see the measurements. And uh, it seems that about 4% uh, are boundary cases now. The nice thing about changing the generator instead of just writing some unit tests for add is that with this new generator, every property that needs some random coins will get ones that provoke values close to the boundary when they're added together sometimes. So other properties will be tested better as well because I have a better generator. You can even ask QuickCheck to show you minimal examples with each kind of label. So for example, here's a normal case, zero plus zero. Yeah, that's normal. Here's a boundary case that sums to 999999. You just add zero and 99999. Here's one that sums to one million, zero and a million. Here's one that sums to a million and one, zero and a million and one. Oh, oh no, you can't do that, of course, because a million and one would not be a valid argument. No, here you need one and a million and one. So you see, quick check finds a way of hitting each of these things in a valid way. Here's the overflow case. Um, you can add three to a million, and that will then be labeled as an overflow case. So it's really useful to look at these because they show you if you've made a mistake in your labeling, and you're relying a lot on labeling to be sure your testing is effective. Um, so it's important to see some examples. These are useful to look at for that reason. So there's actually a method here that one can use. Uh, when you're writing property-based tests, of course you have to write a property, but you should still think about what are the important kinds of case you want to test. But don't write unit tests, write labeling code. Measure how often each kind of important test is generated and if you don't like the result, tune the generation and keep doing it until every kind of important test is tested sufficiently often. Okay, so what have we seen? Well, I've shown you that property-based testing has helped us find bugs in real systems that you would never find with a handwritten test case. It's particularly good at finding feature interactions, which is just impractical to write tests for all of those but property-based testing can find them. I hope I've persuaded you that the result of shrinking, those shrunk and fail tests are really easy to debug. A lot of the test case simplification that you would do manually is done for you. 
I've talked about model-based tests. Uh, I showed how to apply them in sequential settings, concurrent settings, distributed settings. But they sometimes have a weakness that you replicate too much code in the tests. If that happens, I've shown you metamorphic tests that avoid that problem. And uh, I've also discussed how you have to still think about what are the important kinds of tests you want to run. Don't turn off your brain. Think about what's important. Label the important cases, measure and tune. What's the TLDR? Don't write tests, generate them. And if you'd like to know more, uh, then here is a slide with three links to two papers and another talk that go into more detail about all of the things that I've talked about. Okay, and uh, that's me. Have we any questions? Wonderful. Thanks very much, John. Uh, uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating talk. So, uh, everyone on the uh, on the webinar, uh, if you have questions, uh, please submit them via the uh, uh, go to web webinar uh, questions uh, facility. Uh, a couple of them uh, have come in already, so uh, if that's all right, I'll uh, I'll be the uh, uh, the person who uh, uh, who uh, passes them on. Um, so, John, you talked about uh, how you generate uh, 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 quite large uh, uh, failing, uh, fa failing inputs um, and then you shrink them down. Um, can you say a little bit more about why, why that shrinking step is necessary? Couldn't you have made the generator generate little tests to start with? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, may I show my slides again? Is the slide now visible? No, it's not. Okay, uh, let me just wait a moment. So what I'm going to show you is results of a small experiment um, that illustrates why we do this. So this is an experiment when I was looking for a bug that I knew existed that was just four steps long and fairly easy to find. So what I could do is I could generate random tests of various sizes and see how many of them hit the bug. And uh, what you see here is the measured probability of failure as a function of the number of steps in the test case. Now you might think, I'm looking for a bug that I know is four steps long, so why don't I just generate four-step tests? Well, the measured probability of, of finding the bug with a four-step test is zero. No four-step test that I ever generated in this experiment actually failed. On the other hand, if we look at the tests that are, say, 40 steps long, then 60% um, of those tests revealed the bug. So we can see here that the probability, probability of a test revealing the bug rises dramatically as the size of the test case increases. And the intuition is the one that I gave during the talk, right? It's because what matters is that somewhere in this larger test, the bad sequence that provokes the bug happens, um, but it doesn't matter so much exactly where it appears. Now, you might object and you might say, well, yes, longer tests may be more likely to hit the bug, but they're also more expensive to run. Of course, that's true. So the right thing to measure here is not the probability of failure per test, but the probability of failure per step. Right, per unit of work. And if we look at that graph, here it is. On the x-axis, you still have the total size of each test case. But what this shows is how much each step contributes to the probability of failure. So if you generate test cases of length four, as we saw, it's zero. If you generate test cases of length 30, we're around the peak. And uh, for each step, then, you've got you know, a 1.6% chance of Right of the bug. And this graph really shows how the bang for the testing buck varies as the size of the test case grows. Longer tests are quite simply far more effective per unit of effort of provoking faults. And this is an effect that we have observed many, many times with property based tests, and other people working in random testing have also observed something similar. So it seems to be a very general phenomenon 
and you want to know about it and take advantage of it. The way you take advantage of it is by generating larger tests, but to make debugging the results feasible, you need to shrink them to a minimal failure result. So this is a key reason why this works so well. Thank you very much. Uh, another question came in. Um, is property-based testing restricted to functional programming languages? Um, well, so the second uh, test that I showed you was testing low-level C code that runs on the hundred or so processors in cars. So absolutely not. Um, some of the most exciting projects we've done have been for customers who have not been using functional programming languages for their system. But we used functional programming languages for the properties, for the models. And uh, that that is, um, I think you really do want to use purely functional properties, purely functional models, because if you start getting tests failing because of side effects in your model, you know, God help you especially once you start shrinking, it's not at all obvious to the user what order different bits of the model will get evaluated in. And people who try to use side effects there get very confused. That said, there are re-implementations of the property-based testing idea in virtually every major programming language, including the ones that are not functional. Um, but I would say when you use those implementations, you should use them in a purely functional way just to avoid your brain exploding. Exploded brains are ugly. We don't like to see that. All right. Uh, uh, there are there are some more questions, but unfortunately, we're uh, upon uh, uh, upon time. Uh, thanks very much, John, uh, for uh, uh, for giving the uh, giving the talk and answering our questions. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, uh, for attending, and I uh, hope to see you uh, at the next uh, Octo uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugo. It was great fun.